All right, I'm here today with Tarl Yarber. Tarl, what's up, dude? I appreciate you being on the show. What's up? How's it going? Thanks for having me. Dude, this is this is exciting. We were talking before, and uh, you were already telling me a bunch of cool stuff, so I'm ready to unpack it so everybody else can hear. You started doing wholesaling, which I want to talk about way back in the day in 05. You, day. After about a year, it seems like you're like, no, screw that. A couple years later, you get into flipping. You flip 650-plus houses over whatever, 10, 12-year time span. And sure. then you sounds like you transition more into some buy and hold. And then you have an event business and you're very good at systems. Obviously, you have to be if you flip over 600 something homes. So I'm excited to unpack it all. So we'll rewind, start back at the beginning, wholesaling in 05. <laughs> and then why did you exit out of it so quickly in 06? What was that like? What's the thought process there? Uh, so I, I go in a lot of depth on this, like on episode 189 of Bigger Pockets. So I'll give you the like the short story because it's it's only like one percent of my story, right? Like so for, <laughs> uh, but it's only it's actually the only relatable part of my story for a lot of people, unfortunately. But um, the uh, no, I went to a sellathon, right? A basically a massive conference that has all the big, huge name, a list celebrity speakers at it that you only have to spend a hundred bucks to go to. Uh, which, by the way, that's a trick. Like, if you see a conference with a bunch of A-list celebrities and the ticket price is only 100 to 200 bucks, they're going to sell you something when you get there. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. How they, that's how they make money at the conference, right? Speaking <laughs> from events business. Um, so, anyways, I did that. I was 20 years old, and uh, Robert Kiyosaki was speaking there, and he doesn't, you know, he doesn't sell anything. So, I, uh, but I was obsessed with Rich Dad Poor Dad. I read his book when I was 17 and it changed my entire life. Uh, and so, at 20, he's speaking at the LA uh, Staples Center, and I lived in Sacramento at the time. So I drive down there, you know, spend a hundred bucks on the thing. I'm so, so excited. It's a three day conference. Uh, they had Russell Simmons there from Def Jam wow. records. They had, uh, they had, uh, Donald Trump was a keynote right back when he only did real estate. Uh, the, the, <laughs> uh, they had, uh, uh, Tony Robbins there. They had all the, any big name you could think of was there was a massive thing called the learning addicts at the time in 2005, went to it. And I'm just starry eyed 20 year old, like, wow. Right. Uh, and I see all these people buying stuff and like running to the back of the room and there's 40,000 people at this thing. Um, uh, and I'd have no money. And so, but yet this one speaker shows up on stage, his name is Marshall Silver. He's actually become like a really close friend of mine over the years. Uh, but at the time, like he was just like, he was, he was, he's the best at closing people from the stage, right? I didn't know that. Right? I'm 20 years old. He's, he's known in the industry for being one of the best stage closers. Um, and, uh, but he sells like kind of like a Tony Robbins esque thing, like subconscious stuff, like, you know, how to become a millionaire, break your boundaries in your mind, you know, like all that stuff. And whatever he did, right place, right time, you know, subconscious reprogramming on me or something. I got up and I ran to the back of the room and I had no money, but I had an America's Express charge card with a $3,000 limit on it. And it's a charge card, so you got to pay it off in 30 days. Uh, super broke, but his program was about 1500 bucks, like 1495 that might as well have been like 15,000 bucks, 150,000. Like, cause I had never even seen $1,500 in my life at that point, uh, growing up how I grew up. Uh, and so I put it on there. I, I bought the thing. I walk out of the room, I drop to my knees and I have a yellow pad and I just start writing, I'm going to be a millionaire. Like all this stuff. I was like super, I drank all the Kool-Aid, but that has nothing to do with real estate. But now I'm sitting there going like, all right, I have $1,500. I need, I have 30 days to pay this. I'm a college student, full-time college, full-time working at Sears too, right? And I was also doing Air Force ROTC for college as well because that's what I wanted to, to be at that time. Uh, and the uh, I'm like, how am I going to pay this? I have no idea. Uh, and then I saw on the little docket uh, seminar, like sorry, a, a breakout session called how to turn $10 into 30, $10 into $10,000 in 30 days or less. You're like, sign like, me up, baby. Let's go. I, I got 30 days. <laughs> like I need to pay this thing up. So I went to the the info session, which was like a small breakout. And, uh, and this lady was selling this 900, $895 thing about, um, wholesaling real estate. Never heard of it in my entire life. Right? I have no idea what it is, but she had an overhead projector and she was like showing overhead projections of checks of 10 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand wholesale checks. Right. Uh, and she was explaining assignment of contracts and it was eight ninety five, not for a seminar, but eight ninety five, but just for the books and tapes. Right. Cause it was tape. Actually, no, she had CDs. Uh, and, and I'm like, all right, I'll put it. I'm already 
1500 bucks well. deep. I got three grand on this thing. Let's go another 900, right? And I'm going to make 10 grand in 30 days. <laughs> like, this is what's going to happen. And uh, and that's how I got into wholesaling real estate. <laughs> so, oh, my gosh. Did you make the money back or no? Yeah, no, no. That didn't no, work no, at no. all. Exactly. Yeah. For, <laughs> so, but I kid you not, but you talk about naivety. Like, I, I straight up was like, this is going to work. Like, I oh, left wow. that conference. There's a Starbucks not far from the Staples Center. I drove over there and, like, I immediately opened up the CDs and immediately opened up the workbooks and immediately just started doing like whatever this is going to say to do, I'm going to do. Um, the negative side of it, looking back, right, that I didn't wasn't really aware of is that it's a lot easier to make 10 grand in 30 days wholesaling real estate if you have any kind of marketing budget whatsoever. Yep. And I didn't put two and two together on that stuff. I'm like, no, I just used all my money. Like <laughs> I have to, like, how am I going to get like properties, right? And she explained in the CDs, well, if you don't have any money, you got to go door knock, right? And so go down to the county recorder. This is back before you had all the uh, the foreclosure data online and you could find out defaults. So I had to go to the Sacramento recorder's office, like which she, she taught to do. I'd get the list of the NODs for that day, right? Notice defaults. Uh, and you'd had to then, all it had as a name, right? I then had to go like pull the fish tape of like the recorded deed because they didn't have this stuff on record yet. This is 2005, not that long ago. What do you think about it, right? We've come a long way. Long way, long way. And then I'd have to like pull the fish tape, right? And then look up their deed of trust and try to find the note on file if I could and find an address and do whatever. Like I had these four and I do that and then I go door knock. Right. And, uh, and I did that. It took about six months, give or take for me to do my first deal. By then I was in full default on all my credit cards. Oh, uh, yeah. by then, like I also pulled all my cash advances on my other credit cards, dropped out of college by then. Right? All stuff. <laughs> just and crash and burn. Just kind of go, go full in. Right. And, uh, the, and like, I got my first deal, made like five grand. Um, but two deals later, so basically I'd say seven, eight months, I, I have to, I always forget what the exact time frame was, but seven, eight months after buying it, uh, we did a whole, uh, double and close, uh, to do for a hundred thousand um, dollar, assignment fee. And that was on 40 acres in Smith river, California. And, uh, and that, that then I was able to take that money and pay off my credit cards and do all the stuff you're, that I yeah, had. You're, and, you're like you're just and, out of the red at this point. Correct. And then I stopped. And I was like, this sucked the whole time. I'm done. And so Dude. as soon as I, we closed that one, I just dropped out completely. How many people do you think get into wholesaling with that same mentality, not understanding the work that goes behind it? I think, I, and I think to be fair, social media and whatever can make anything seem easier yeah. than it is. But there's a lot of folks who don't have a lot of money who are brought into the wholesaling space because it's preached as like, Hey, this is a way to get in. If you don't have a lot of capital, what can be true, but I, I don't think people really understand the amount of work that goes into it to actually get a deal. Now, I was talking to a guy not long ago who we work with on the rental and flip side of things who also wholesaled. And I asked him, I was like, how long does it take you to get a deal? He said on average, now I don't know if this is standard. I don't know enough about the wholesale world. He said on average, it's about 43 hours of cold calling per one deal. Like, that's a lot of work to get that's one. You can make, if you make $10,000 assignment fee, hey, that's a good week. But who, who has the discipline to sit there and call for 40 hours a week? Not a lot of people. Yeah. Most people that get into it, I think wholesaling is one of the more harder things because you got to know a lot about, you got to know something about everything with it. You got to understand mm -hmm. at least, you know, how to sell, you know, how to, how to market. You got to understand how to evaluate the real estate. Hopefully uh, you got to understand how to pull ARVs as is comps, uh, how to, you know, at least get some sort of budget figured out to know what it is, negotiate the contracts, get escrow, know how to get assignment con like you got to learn all that stuff, right? Which is why when like I look at other investors like myself that talk crap about wholesalers, I'm like, that's just like, no, they don't, they're learning, right? They have a lot of pieces to put together, right? And like help them figure that stuff out and they might send you the deal. So that was kind of our strategy for a long, long time, especially in Seattle, Tacoma was like, I got almost all my deals from wholesalers and then real estate agents that we would help like figure stuff out with. Yep. Uh, and, and my tactic with that was like, Hey, if you're a wholesaler, you want to drive any of my properties ever, you can do it. Like, I don't care. And so you, we, we, we drive properties on these days. You can meet me or Nate or Serena or whoever. Uh, and, and we'll walk the property with you. you we show you how we bought it and we show you how the construction works mm -hmm. and they learn and guess who they send their first deal to. That's I will say this, you know, you line up a hundred wholesalers in a room, maybe like five of them are ever going to get a deal. <laughs> like it's oh, tough. For so. sure. Yeah. But you just don't know which one. Over half the time too, right. when they do have one. Yeah. And they have, and when they finally get one, it's not always like a real deal. Cause they might get like stuff tied up, but it's not a real deal. Yeah. Um, 
when they get that real deal, I just want always to make sure that like they send it to me. And so that was a big thing that we, we loved on wholesalers. We still do. Um, but I have seen Jaren like is a lot of, a lot of guys that like focus on their, they get their first deal. Like there's plenty of times, like that's the last deal. Right. Mm. And where a wholesaler, a blind squirrel finds a nut, they get it, they make it happen. They get excited. They make their 10 grand, 15 grand or whatever. More often than not, right. What they typically, what I've seen go wrong is they go like, wow, I made that finally. Now let me put a hundred percent of the money I just made <laughs> and put it yeah. right back into marketing and all the things that I never had the opportunity to do. And then they blow all that money and they never get the deal, another deal. And then now they're out and now their spouse and family's just like, see, it was a waste of time. Yep. Uh, and, but the, there's few of them because there always is that all of a sudden take it to the next level and they make it actually happen and they become consistent with it. Um, but that's why you don't see very many professional because it's, it's sales and marketing at the end of the day. Yes. And it's not, it's not a, like I tell a lot of investors, and I'm like, look, you're either, if you're going to do acquisitions, like that needs to be a separate entity in a separate business. That's not investing. That's separate, right? Uh, you are sales and marketing when you're doing acquisitions and then you're, you're investing when you're buying it, right? So separate those two mentally and it just, it'll yes. help, right? 100%. Yeah. We, we give wholesalers a bad rap around here, just like kind of poking fun more than anything. Like we get a ton of deals from them. We call them the bottom feeders. I don't know if that's nice or not, but that's kind of our nickname for them. But to your point, you made a you may mention that you invested time into them, you networked with them. So then when they had deals, they brought it to you. And I think we like those of us who are in real estate been in it for I mean, you've been in a lot longer than I have, but I've been in it long enough to understand that networking is huge uh in real estate or anything in life. But I think people hear that word so much that it almost becomes cliche and they don't really know what to do with it. And they think it's just jargon. But it really, really, really is a powerful tool if you can find a way to put yourself around people who can help you and that you can help and then offer as much value as you can, you're probably going to get value in return. Every wholesaler I've worked with, every real estate um, or investor friendly agent I've worked with, contractor, property manager, like trying to get leads, when I show them that I'm serious and I'm investing time with them, they're going to bring those leads to me first. And yep. then when they bring the lead to you and it's a good one, and you close and they get compensated and they know you're ready to close when it's a good deal that meets your buy box, bro, at that point, it almost becomes a well-oiled machine. People be like, man, Jaren, how do you get deals coming to you all the time? I'm like, because I have spent years building up relationships with people who know if they bring me something that makes sense, I'm going to buy it. But not only am I going to buy it, they're going to get compensated, whether it's a referral fee, whether it's their assignment fee from a wholesale. And just for the record, anybody listening who doesn't know what wholesaling is, and Tarl, if you want, if I explain it wrong, butcher it, yeah, feel free to jump in. Job, but they, <laughs> they essentially they're marketing to get properties under contract. Once they have the contract executed, they then go and assign that contract to an end buyer, so an investor like myself or a flipper like Tarl, and then we'll take it and we'll do whatever we want with the pro property. So essentially, the wholesaler is just locking up a contract, selling the contract to another yep. person, and they're out of the deal and they make money on their assignment. Fee. Yeah, exactly. Like you said, it, the the quickest summary is like you're buying a contract, you're selling a contract to somebody else to, and that's your assignment fee. Yeah. So that's all it is at the end of the day is selling yeah. contracts. And, and it's then, a uh, grind. It's a yeah, grind. It's, it's a grind, but like there's people that I know and I'm sure you know that like do really well at it. Right. Yeah. And I see it as a tool. Like we've assigned plenty of properties over the years ourselves, but it's always been like a tool. It's not our, it's not my strategy, but it's a tool in real estate. Right. Like, um, I'm like, Hey, with this property, we tied up, but like at the end of the day, like this, I don't really want to do this one or it's not in our buy box or it's not like our thing, but it doesn't mean it's a bad deal. Yep. So, but we have friends that will buy it. So we'll just like assign it to them. Right. Sign and it then, up. so that the key is getting undervalued deals. Correct. Because if you don't have undervalued deals with no meat on the bone, then you don't have no leverage. When you have undervalued deals, just like you said, now you have options. You want to burn this, you want to flip it. We want to assign it. I mean, you, you take your pick. So you do this till 06, you get out, and then you kind of go quiet, I guess, in the real estate world yeah, for five quiet. years until you come <laughs> on the scene strong flipping yeah, in no 2011. Way. So how does how does all that unfold? Uh, yeah, so I disappear for a while. No, in reality, I actually became a financial planner and went full-time, nice. dropped out of college, all that stuff. Uh, saw the 08 crash through that. Like, There's a lot of stories that will take way too long to, to get into on this. That's not totally relative, I guess. But um, I was in it, <laughs> so let's just put it that way. You lived through uh, it. Lived in it. And also the mortgages, like seeing all that I was doing. I was a crusader against negative AM loans back in like 2006, 2007, like became more of my passion and stuff. 
uh, at that time, which is another reason why I technically stopped doing real estate because I just loved what I was doing, which was teaching people finances and how to get out of like, why are you doing a negative loan? That's going to destroy you. Like, I learned all that stuff back then, but size point. Awesome. Um, the, uh, but in 2010, I kind of had like a joke about having like a quarter life crisis. Um, I was right around 25, 26. Uh, and I was just like, hated everything. Like I had a girlfriend issue, a family issue, a bunch of stuff was going on. I just got audited by the IRS. Got audited by the IRS. Like, oh the same time. like everything just like dropped, like every anvil is getting dropped on me, right? Uh, you get the credit cards paid off and then it's like the next challenge in life. Yeah, yeah, like, well, this is years later, but yeah. Um, you know, by then I had more success in financial services and all the things I was doing there. But uh, yeah. I had an office, I had a, like everything. And I was just like, started like running away, running off my team like that I had because we were brokerage. And because I'd be like, anybody that complained about anything i'd be like you know you think that's bad and like i started doing it, it, was, it was, i became very toxic uh and uh so anyways i pretty much was burnt out from that business and uh long story short i just basically uh quit doing financial services and then uh through a series of circumstances i decided to leave sacramento and go up to seattle just like on a whim uh and brought my girlfriend at the time with me and we just both decided just like let's just get the hell out of here and then we just moved to seattle uh had no plan when i was there the only thing I decided to do was I reread Rich Dad Poor Dad. Like I was like, mm -hmm. let me go back to like, I had the, cause I did a lot of personal development, like a ton, like I had to change who I was. And uh, the, so I always, I never stopped doing it. I still do it now. And the, so one of the things that I decided to do, I was like, all right, how did I get in? How did I drop out of college? Let me go read back to that. A real estate thing. Cool. I remember being into that. Got into financial services. Like I need to rechange my thinking. What's my next chapter? Let me go back to where I started. Right, mm. which was rich that poor that. So I reread that. I'm like, yeah, I'm a real estate. It was cool. And every single day, I actually still have the book. Um, every single day, I would write in this journal book um, one money making idea. Right. That was wow. just like, and it was just to get my thinking. I had to think of, I'm like, I, had, I came up with some wacky shit, but like, <laughs> uh, but it was like, but it was the habit. It was like building a muscle. I had to start thinking outside of the box, like, what's my next chapter? What's my next chapter? So I just, I don't remember where I got it from, but I just started writing one money making idea a day in a book. And some of it was really stupid. But uh, the but real estate came up, and then rereading Rich Dad Poor Dad, I'm like, maybe I should pursue that again. Really long story short, um, I got associated with a company out of Arizona called Charter Home Alliance. Uh, Charter Home Alliance was a service uh, area manager for Fannie Mae, and so okay. what that what that is, in short, they still exist. Uh, is they do the construction, like the rehab and construction repairs for Fannie Mae for any properties that they had. Uh, in their portfolio that wasn't like, that was basically a real estate owned portfolio, the foreclosures. Mm -hmm. And so there's a whole process behind that. This is a massive industry by 2011 uh, and 2010, 2011, to where you had all these third party asset management companies and asset management companies and banks that like had retained all these properties from the big crash and they needed contractors to work on them. And they were just creating, it was like the wild, wild west, by the way, like between 2009 and 2015 wow. was like, the REO wild, wild west. It was insane. Like I got so many insane stories during that time period, being behind the scenes, working with asset managers and Fannie and Freddie and like all these things that we were doing with this construction. Uh, and some of the stuff we did with nonprofits, like it was crazy. Um, too much to unpack. But I got associated with this Charter Home Alliance company and they needed somebody to be like their representative to go fly around and like build these relationships locally. Uh, and I was really good at networking. And I'm like, I, I'm like, oh, I understand all this stuff. So I came on board as an independent contractor and became their, their national sales manager uh, and created like kind of like a revenue share with them. Uh, and I then opened up Washington, Arizona, started flying around and that got me into REO. So, and by getting into REO, I met basically what would happen. This is what I'm trying to keep this really short is I would fly into an area. I'd meet all the top real estate agents in the entire area that did REO. Guys that would have three, 400 uh, properties under management for, uh, Fannie Mae or another bank oh, sure. that they'd have to hold on to. That's the shadow inventory that people talked about back then. And they were only allowed to list like 30, 40, 50 at a time, right? So they were just, but they had to maintain all these. These are agents. Uh, and and I would have to make friends with these guys and then convince them that like, hey, when you have a project that Fannie wants you to go do construction on, use our company. Uh, and And we would do that. I would then become friends with the asset managers and I would then become friends with all the contractors locally and they would become what's called a paper contractor of ours. So we'd recruit these contractors that were full GCs. They couldn't work on these properties unless they were approved by Fannie Mae. We were. So we would then sign them up as a subcontractor of ours and they would just be a GC and we'd make our spread, right? That's wow. what we did. 
And so we did <laughs> thousands and thousands of these. Uh, and, uh, and so, and I, so now all of a sudden, the reason why I'm telling you the story is that now all of a sudden here it is, it's 2011 going into 2020, like mid 2011 ish. I'm in all the major markets. I know all the REO agents. They all know me. I know all the contractors. They all are signed up with us. And we're like, and then we had this opportunity to get like some properties from uh, Wells Fargo, uh, PAS technically. Uh, and, and we're like, wait, why don't we just start doing that? Why don't we start buying some of these? And then yeah. it just started. This is not the relatable story that you don't say on bigger pockets, right? So, uh, and that's all of a sudden, me and a couple of the guys that were part of this, we started buying these properties and like it got cray cray really fast. Uh, and then we had to find money and money was hard. Like, dude, I can ran on this. It's not, it's a, it was the stuff we used to do to get REO deals from the banks and like how that would happen. And like, it just became just a massive thing really fast and a few hundred deals in a very short period of time. Um, how long did that last? Like how long were y'all playing that foreclosure game started in 2011? Yeah. Like, how long were you able to ride that? So, so me personally, uh, till 2014. And then I had a really horrible breakup with the guys, not charter charter and I are still friends, but the, uh, the company that came out of that group, that was okay. a couple of us, part of that, including some of the owners of charter. And then eventually they left and it doesn't matter, but like long story short, it became three of us that ran a business together. Uh, and in February, 2014, like I lived in Seattle, the other two guys lived in Arizona. Like we were just freaking going hard. Like <laughs> there's a lot of, like a lot of volume. Um, but how many homes do you think you did from 2011 to 14? Uh, well, like 400 or something like that. Yeah. So the, it was like 350, 400, something like that. Um, it was a lot, right. But you're talking to like, these are like lipstick, lick sticks. Sometimes it would just be whole tails, right? Like where we just like, we'd get the property and just put it right back on, or we would uh, get the property and transfer it to somebody else. Or like, there's just a bunch of stuff that we did that was like quick flip stuff and quick turns. Okay. Um, some of them we'd full rehab, some of them we would do nothing to. Right. Uh, and there's a lot of, a lot of, um, rabbit holes we can go on. This stuff that I've tried to like, that's not applicable today that you just can't get away with today. Yeah. To be honest yeah, with you. yeah. So, but I had, so anyways, long story short in February, 2014, uh, at that time, worst day of my life, uh, when I found out that my two partners were like massively backstabbing me and how, that's how I perceived it at least. Like they're looking back on it. We've kind of made some amends to realize that I, both sides were pretty dumb, including me, right? Uh, money does funny things to people. Yes. And like one of my partners became a major miser, right? Just like wouldn't even pay contractors. The other guy got into like, you know, nefarious stuff. And uh, and it was it just a bunch of stuff started changing people. And uh, and they both looked at me kind of as an enemy at one point. And I, long story short for that, like I saw that like, wait, I'm getting backstabbed hard. And, uh, and how I found out, I confront them with it. It was like basically the way I perceived it was these are these are blood brothers for life. It's us against the world, yeah. right? We're gonna take on everybody. And then apparently I was the only one that felt that way <laughs> and, uh, at that time. And then my life just crushed around me fast. And I'm like, I'm done with real estate. My my now wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, uh, she wasn't living with me yet. At this place on Alki Beach in Seattle on the on the waterfront. It was like cool little you know bachelor pad thing, uh, and she comes over after she gets off work and she just sees me with a bunch of I, the same day. All she sees is a bunch of Ikea like boxes and me just putting together furniture. Cause I, I went to, I, when I brought what well, this all happened, my lethargic thing was like, I just got out of the house, went to Ikea and just started buying stuff. Just started buying stuff. <laughs> like, I just, brought it, just brought it back to my apartment. And like, I just started making furniture like <laughs> just to kind of keep my brain moving. Oh, but, uh, gosh. but I, that, that collapsed that partnership. Uh, big time. And I stayed out of real estate for about six months, got my EMT license. I was going to uh, search the certification. I was going to become a firefighter. I'm like, I'm done with wow. real estate forever. Because uh, by then I was doing search and rescue and ski patrol and a bunch of stuff that I like to do part time. Still, still love to do that stuff. Uh, and, and then within that six month period, a buddy of mine convinces me to teach him how to wholesale. I'm like, sure, why not? I'm just going to help you. Then I get a taste again, right? Of that, like that little <laughs> taste, and like ah, oh, deal man, junkie, deal junkie. I'm like, oh, man, this is kind of good. And then, uh, then I had a a fund, right? A small fund, a fifteen million dollar fund out of Arizona that we used to do deals with. Hit me up, going like, why aren't we doing deals with you anymore? We hate your partners. Uh, and like, what happened to you? They wanted to buy in Seattle, and so we created a JV uh, where we started partnering uh, and splitting equity, and they gave me basically a fifteen million dollar line. Uh, and I just started buying properties in Seattle, October, 2014. And 
and then I've got, you know, I was an equity owner and all that stuff. Like, so we split those properties down the middle for the most part. And that all of a sudden made me go like, cool. It's like, I kind of had like this, uh, the way I analogize it is that because of everything we did for years you know, between 2011, 2014, I had this like perfect storefront of like a Starbucks, right? That I just, all I did was just shut the doors down and just close it and say, we're done. But everything is inside. Everything works. Everything's ready to go. All the systems. Mm. And all I did was just open the doors back up and be like, all right, let's just get back at this again. And we did it better this time. Um, so when we restarted, I'm sure the having the pure cash buyer that behind my back for finances did not hurt at all. <laughs> so, but that's part yeah. of JV. Like it was JV and deals. Like that's technically all I was doing was set up a JV agreement with this fund. Yep. Uh, and which were just good dudes, two good dudes out of Arizona. And, um, and then after about eight months of that, this is actually how I met Serena, who we've talked about that. Um, I just, I had 27 active projects going on by myself uh, and in Seattle. And then I hired my first person to bring them on. I'm like, this is a real business now. Uh, and the, and we're just going. And then, uh, then I ended that partnership and started buying them all internally instead, as soon as we got just our yourself. funding together. Right. Uh, still talk to those dudes. They're great guys. And they understood, yeah. like they got their stuff. <laughs> Trust me. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, and how did how did y'all before this line of credit? Because I know listeners are probably wondering. So line of line credit's of credit. like a loose term. It wasn't a line of credit, but we'll call it a line of credit. Yeah, I get what you're saying. You had fifteen million dollars to play with. Private, you had I had private, 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 private money, money lenders, partner, right? Basically, let's put it that way, right? They yeah. were equity partners where you're splitting whatever, call it fifty right. fifty on each deal. They right. just were like, bro, we got up to quote unquote fifteen mil. Go flip as many houses as possible. But yeah. from eleven to fourteen, before you had that. Mm -hmm. How were you guys structuring those deals? How are you getting funding to do 400 plus deals in a matter of three? Are you struggling to manage your real estate business across multiple spreadsheets, tools that aren't connected, and a banking solution that's not built for your needs? You need a partner like Baselane. You need a simple yet powerful platform to manage your rental property business. Baselane is the number one banking platform built for real estate investors. It's business checking, online rent collection, bookkeeping, tax reporting, analytics, and more all in one place. With Baselane, start automating your rental business finances and say goodbye to countless hours of busy work while taking control of your rental property finances to reduce expenses and increase your rental income. Join more than 40,000 real estate investors who trust Baselane to manage your rental property finance with confidence. Open an account in minutes. It's that fast. Head over to baselane.com slash cowboy and sign up for the chance to win a $500 Amazon gift card. That's B-A-S-E-L-A-N-E dot com slash cowboy, C-O-W-B-O-Y. And you're going to be entered into a raffle for the opportunity to win a $500 Amazon gift card. Go sign up today. Picture this. You're ready to put an offer on the perfect investment property, but then you hit a wall. Financing. Dealing with hard money lenders is the biggest headache us real estate investors have, and I thought that's just how hard money had to be until I met Backflip. Backflip is totally different. They're changing hard money by making loans actually stress-free, and I know this firsthand because I personally use them for my own deals. It's the perfect combo of tech and real people. Their free app makes everything more efficient, and every loan is personalized to what matters to you, be it low interest, high leverage, or zero payments until you sell or refi. And while other lenders just write a check and forget about you, Backflip has been a true partner for my business. Call them anytime with any question. Even if you don't borrow for them, you can use their app to pull comps and estimate profits. Discover the Backflip difference at backflip.mobi backslash finance cowboy pod. Hey guys, when you're just starting out as a real estate investor, finding deals is the most important thing you can do. But unfortunately, it can also be your biggest hurdle. And let me tell you, it gets even harder when your business grows and you don't have a lot of time to look for properties and evaluate deals like you did on the front end. That's why you need to work with New Western. New Western has properties ready for rehab on their marketplace today. That means you skip the hours of research, driving neighborhoods, or calling agents. And instead, you get to start with a ready-made property. You can rehab and flip it or rehab it and burr it and hold it as a rental. So why is New Western good at what they do? Well, they buy and sell a property every 13 minutes. They work exclusively with investors and value-add properties, and that's all they do. They're licensed agents, they have a network of lenders, and they'll help you grow your business. So if you're ready to jumpstart your next project, visit newwestern.com, join their marketplace, and access the largest private source of rehab properties in the nation. Yeah, so that's where 
well, these guys were part of that for a little bit, right? So that's right. how we were just searching for 2011. This is what people like when they think about like right now, this is actually a good thing to talk about today, right? So I own a hard money company, right? A hard money lending company, fixated funding. And and so I see what it's like on the back end with like selling to the secondary market. I know what it's like to get lending and stuff and having to use it on our end. And people are like, oh man, two points still or 12%, it's gone up, right? We could do 10 or this. Like, dude, in 2011, if you can get a hard money loan for two points and 12% for 12 months <laughs> at 80%, you'd be like, this is, they're just giving money away. Like that's how it felt, right? Because in reality in 2011, 2012, 2013, one, can you find a hard money lender? Two, they're doing like three to four points yep. at like, 12 to 16 percent depending on who you were at like 70 to 80 percent right of total uh that includes rehab like they were 80 percent rehab uh at five month terms right and with a two-point re-up for two months right so you get your extension for two points for two more months like that's all you get. and then it is two points after every time like that was like that's a, quick that was a good deal <laughs> like so like that was good oh, so um uh, so yeah, like that's what you're working with, right? At that time. And then uh, and it was all relationship based and everything and trust. Like they didn't have these, now people are spoiled today. Even today is still spoiled compared to what it was then. Uh, and good luck getting normal traditional bank financing that actually made sense, right? Back then. Oh, so yeah. the ramble has more to do with like anybody we met that had money, right? We would bring them the deal. So we're basically, when I say those many deals, we might have had two, three partners on each deal. We might have had like JVs on different ones. We might have had private money lender and a partner on one. We were anything we could slice because we had, we just had a bunch of properties, right? So to us, making five grand or six grand on a flip was easy. We we're like, yeah, do it, whatever. Has a system. Because like we had the system for it, right? And that was just money, right? They were like, yeah, that's, we just made six grand or eight grand, 10 grand, whatever, uh, 20 grand. Like, and we just like, quick, put it on the balance sheet, move on next one. Like, so it was just a constant thing. So even if though, oh, this deal has these two guys on it, this deal has this one guy on it, this deal over here has a hard money lender and a private money for back end. This, this one we bought ourselves, this one, over, like, it was just a system of money, right? Like, and how to control that. And we were willing to give away like tons of equity just because we needed to keep the business moving with it. Right. Uh, and so sometimes when I look back on like, yeah, I did less deals since then but I make massive profits on each deal since then yeah. versus then we'd be happy if we made like, you know, like we made six grand that's split three ways. Right. <laughs> well, like, <'cause> it was <laughs> the business, right? So after taxes, like 1200 bucks. Yeah. Which is why I like, you know, no, ahead, sorry. sorry, but I'm talking a lot, but uh, yeah. which is why when I like see people brag about their like doors or like how yeah. many deals they've done, I'm like, <laughs> Like I don't want the, I don't what's bullshit. Like so, so, yeah, that? we all like all of us like, who are in it. I know. Like yeah. you, without before before I understood the game, I'd be people that meet them. They'd have like five hundred doors or thousand doors. I'm like, yo, how do they do that? And then I'm like, bro, they own like eight percent of that. Yeah, they own like eight percent. They're like a five or one. Right? It's yeah, so they own they own nothing. The, my right. best friend who got me into real estate, they they ran a business pretty much exactly like yours. Uh, maybe not as much on the going for the foreclosures because they started a little bit later. They started probably around 2014. And so um, it wasn't all foreclosures, but they were the same way, dude. They were like, all right, our theory, which ended up being fact, wasn't just theory, is if we can be the folks who find great deals, essentially everything else is going to take care of itself. Now, mm -hmm. that's a flippant back into that statement. But the point is, if you can find great undervalued deals in good locations, finding the money becomes easy. Because what you learn is money is so plentiful and there are tons of folks out there who are waiting to distribute it to you if you can prove, hey, these numbers make sense. Whether they're coming in as a lending partner or whether they're coming in as an equity partner. So be the person that gets a hold of the good deals because now you have leverage. Now you can wholesale it. Now you can flip it. Now you can burr it. Now you can bring in partners. You can do it yourself. But if you don't have a good deal, you have nothing, essentially. Yeah. And like you, you, I, mean, I heard that stuff too at 20 years old with a seminar where I'm like, or the, the CDs pack. It's like, if you find the deal, the money will find you. I'm like, that's bullshit. Like, that's how I felt at the time. Like, because yeah, yeah. I was so focused on the money. But in reality, like, that's a hard one to understand until you like really get in it. Uh, Cause that's what happened. Like, I found when I found my first kind of deal, I found a guy at a meetup uh, in Sacramento. I'm like, can you like come with me to this property? And he's like, yeah. And like, I didn't understand that. I was like, doing an awesome thing for him at the time. I thought he was doing me an awesome favor yep. and like he helped negotiate it. Right. And he bought the deal and I got five grand out of it. I'm like, this was awesome. Right. And, uh, and he got the deal, right. I'm, who knows? I have no idea. He might've just totally 
take advantage of me. But to me, I was like, this is the best thing ever. I bought this guy. He did it all. Like, it was awesome. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and just thinking, you know, and that's, so I brought him to everything I could find, like at that point. And, uh, so it's, you know, there's people out there that like, there's also private money lenders. Like they don't know where to put their money. Right. And that's where networking comes in. If you got a good deal and you can, and they trust you, the bigger thing with like private money lenders, which is actually how I fund pretty much everything now, yeah. uh, is they just need to trust you that you're going to pay them back. Uh, and they got to trust that your business runs smoothly enough, or you know what you're talking about in your deals, or there's enough meat on the bone that if you mess up, you're still going to pay them back. And that's really what they care about most. After that, like they want the return. Yes. But they want their principal back for sure. <laughs> like that's, that's the biggest thing. So if they, that's, you know, building trust and all that. And I could talk about that forever about how we got private money lenders. But um, I think the, the biggest thing is, is you telling people that, what you just said is that if you can prove that you have a good business and that you can find deals that it will come. I think so many people think that's a false statement because they feel so detached from it because they've never done it. And I remember, like you said, you remember hearing that and you're like, yeah, right. I remember hearing that and I'm like, yeah, right. But if you will continually do deals and you make it known that you're doing deals, let people know in your community, let people know on your personal Facebook, let people know at meetups, then you will go from how do I find a private lender to which private lender am I going to partner with on this? Correct. hundred percent. And it will flip. It will flip, but you can't give up before you ever get started, which is where most people do. And to your point, you mentioned there's a ton of private money out there. Dude, think about the amount of people who don't invest any of their capital and they've got millions. I was listening to a story yesterday of a lady, her and her husband are like mid fifties and they've never invested. Their kids are out of the house and they got $2 million sitting in a savings account. Now that's extravagant. Maybe yeah. not everybody has 2 million, but dude, you got friends, you got family, you got friends of family, you got investors that you can meet at local meetups that have lots and lots, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars that they want to put to work. And if they can get two points and 12% and get their money back in six months, dude, sign me up. They're the ones then bragging about that at the cocktail party yes. to their friends. And they're like, how do I do that too? And, uh, and then, just be able to just make sure you pay them back. <laughs> That's the big yeah. one. <laughs> like, but, or, and if, you know, in 2022, I have a lot of friends that, um, you know, when stuff hit the fan and stuff like that and the market dropped in certain markets, like we got friends in Boise that like just got destroyed uh, in 2022 and they had private money lenders and everything and they lost money, but like how they handled it with those private money lenders and, or those partners is what then makes it, even though they might've lost money or lost money on some of those people, they're now giving them more money again because of how they handled the situation, even if it was negative. And so, and I also have, I, they're no longer friends, but I know people that had similar circumstances that handled it very poorly. And like, they'll never have the credibility to get money from most people ever again. Cause those, those guys talk to each other. The private money lenders talk to each other, but they meet each other at conferences and stuff. Uh, and so even if stuff goes down, handling it the right way, manning up, hat in hand, saying like, this is where we're at. I don't know how to solve it. Like, can we figure this out? And coming and communicating bad news, not just good news, like that goes so long away, right? In this business, for especially if you're in this for the long run, yes. your credibility is everything. So yeah, your name. Yeah. Don't bring reproach to your name. Do the right thing. Yes, if sir. things go bad, communicate. Let them know and then make Absolutely. it right when you can. Absolutely. What is? Uh, and I want to talk about what you're doing today after this, but. We were talking before the show, Serena Norris, I brought her on to work with our company to help get our systems built out. Mm -hmm. You guys, I think you hired her on early on and y'all worked together and built great systems out yep. uh, in your guys' business. So when somebody's looking to flip or, you know, potentially burr, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit, what is important? Like, what do those systems need to look like from a high level people have in place to be successful? Man, I could talk about this forever. So, uh. So I have like, so I've actually made it like a little cool little pyramid, right? That shows how to like, what you need to systemize, right? Do you have a link for that? We can add in the show notes. If you have it, one, send it to me. One day, maybe. Right. <laughs> well, get, send me a picture. We'll believe it or not, person. believe it or not, I got convinced. <laughs> I got convinced in 2022 to make a product for this, right? I made it and nobody knows about it. And I've never sent it to anybody. I've never promoted it. I've never done it. It's 81 videos and it breaks down everything like exactly how you can do what i did which is like i work my entire business from my phone i don't ever go to properties we don't start we started buying in savannah recently i've never i mean i'm never gonna go to those houses and stuff like that we're doing full hundred thousand dollar rehabs and everything like it's all from like what we're gonna talk about in a second but like 
Yeah, I'm working like, out a deal offline. Yeah, for me to I mean, I'm 81 videos and systems <laughs> like, and I'm like, ah, I don't want to be one of those gurus yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> but people need the help, bro. They do, yeah. But I, for me, it's time. Like, I'm just like, man, they do going to ask me questions. But um, the uh, for so the pyramid thing at the bottom kind of it's called business strategy. That's the bottom part. Like, so if you're going to create any kind of you can do this for any system, any whatever. But if you take, take it specifically with real estate, like what is your purpose of it? Like, what's your point of it? What's your trend? What does success look like? What does winning look like? All that stuff has to be really important. Like, what's your ideal outcome? So if you're like, for me, at one point, I didn't mind driving all the properties. I didn't mind meeting the contractors. I didn't mind being like on boots on the ground, making stuff happen. So having a system that got me out of that wasn't important to me at that time, right? And uh, so what was important to me was like staying on budget, <laughs> hiring contractors and making sure like we're doing the scopes right, like and making it to where we're not rethinking it over and over again. So I want a duplicatable thing. I have a big pet peeve in my business of like, hey, if we're doing this on a regular basis, how come we're not documenting that? Because why we should be making it up every time. Like mm. we should be doing the same thing every time. Right. And uh, and then adjusting it like as we need to based on circumstances. But the same thing with like, why are we? why doesn't every Dropbox folder look the same? Like they should look the same. Why it's, it's the same. <laughs> like, like we should have the same five folders for each one. Like that was my, that's my claim to fame is like, you know, systemizing the crap out of Dropbox. But um, the, and we use that for our events companies. We use that for fun. We use that for everything. Everybody's our lending company. Everything is like Dropbox systemize it or Google drive. Cause it kind of goes back and forth. So, but point being, it was like my purpose at the beginning of it was like, I'm okay being an operator in the field. But today, like starting over, I'm like, all right, well, my personal involvement in this business, hard and fast rule says I can't drive the property and I won't drive the property. Therefore, winning and success looks like to me at that bottom foundation, winning and success means like I don't go to the property, right? That's step one. We still stay on budget. We still have to go do all the things that require that you have to do on that property. But one of the hard and fast rules is I don't go to it. So therefore, if that's a hard and fast rule, we got to create a business and a process and train people to make it to where I don't go to the property, right? Mm. And, and do you write that out like for your operator to yes. see so that they can go implement around that? Well, I mean, like they don't need to know I don't go to the property now because we just, it's just like, I don't go to the when property. When you started. Yeah, like, when you we started, it became like a, it became a work towards, right? So like that's the, is you change your thinking in your business when you create these like rules mm -hmm. and it makes you like, think outside of the box. If your goal is it's not everybody's goal. Some people love going to their properties, right? I don't, I never have the, uh, for like, I don't need to see the finished product. Send me the check. Like that's how my mentality is. It Like I don't, I'm not in love with these properties ever. Like, yeah. so I have uh, to go now to shoot content, dude. And I'm like, yeah. bro, oh uh, my gosh, yeah. I just that's want it. my check. <laughs> yeah. For bigger pockets, actually what got like between, I say 2019 and like now for a long time, the only thing that got me to go to a property was because I had to go film a video. And stuff. Yep. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so for, but that, but it changes your thinking. Like where you're like, if I'm not allowed to do this thing, like I die if I do this thing. Mm. Like this is four hour work week all over. Like if you read four hour work week, uh, which is a good thinking a book to think outside of the box. They're like, if you have a 10 hour task and somebody had a gun to your head and said, you had 60 minutes to get it done. Could you get it done? Right? Like what would you do differently to get it done? That's that kind of mentality, right? Like, so you create those rules. Like you only have this much time or you only have this thing or you're not allowed to do this thing you start thinking outside the box you start working with your team to it and it's a work towards right a lot mm -hmm. of times you work towards it um now i started a fund fixed aid capital we're buying single families in different markets well day one when we started i'm like i'm never going to the property we're not working towards that shit this is what it is <laughs> like i'm not going to it right so therefore we have to build it from there uh the so you have, so that's that foundation part. Like, what is that? What's the winning success, success look like? Are you going to be an LP? Are you going to be active? Are you going to, you know, those are all defining like anything. And that's a, that's a bigger thing, but you can take any task, like scope of work building, make a scope of work. Cool. What does success look like to that? Right. Is it you doing it or somebody else doing it? It's like, I'm okay doing it. Cool. Well, then you got to build a system around you doing it. Right. Do you want other people to do it too? And that's success. You or other people can do it. Great. You need to have a duplicatable process. That's not just a way you do it, that other people can do it as well. So you have to have, are you with me on this? Yeah. So, yeah I'm so you start there. The second thing, now we go to real estate. Then you got the, really the next five is just all real estate really, which is acquisitions, uh, transaction coordination funding, which is its own thing. Then you got planning, which a lot of people skip that step. Mm. And then you got the actual rehab, right? 
And then the final step is disposition stabilization, which is like, do you keep it or do you sell it? Right. Uh, and so business is the bottom, uh, acquisitions, you gotta go find the property. Like is the second one. The third one is T and C traffic, uh, sorry, uh, uh, transaction coordination and funding. So you gotta actually, that's a process, especially when you're doing volume, mm. uh, you gotta have a process for that to keep it simple yep. and I'll also get your funding. Cause that's the biggest reason why most people don't scale is typically in their, or at least what they think is their biggest reason is funding, which I think is not, yep. but, uh, and then planning. Everybody skips that, <laughs> but if you plan, sharpen an ax, right, then cut a tree or whatever the hell the phrase is, right? Yeah. That's your, what we found on that, Serena and I, which we talked about, like, uh, you know, Serena came on board with me in 2015 <gasps> as my assistant, but over the years, like, we built these processes and we learned, I think it was right around 2018, we learned, like, wait, if we stop rushing into this shit and, like, take a couple of weeks to plan out the entire property and, like, figure out the scope, floor plans, finish packets, everything, our bids, get it all dialed in. Then we go do stuff to the property. It actually works a lot better, right? Versus just rushing into it. Like, who would have thought? What do you know? What do you know, right? So we started, that became before, you can't do any construction on our properties until, and I'll wait, I don't care how long it takes. Like, we've waited months, like, to, like, dial stuff in. I just did it on a property recently. It's like, bro, we're not going until it's ready. Yeah. Some some people get terrified by that, right? But the uh, uh, and I have friends that definitely think I'm an idiot with it. I'm like, whatever. I have no stress in my life, <laughs> so for the so exactly. uh, I'm not getting called for change orders. Like the so so anyway, so we do that, and then the, then you start the rehab construction and make it happen. You maintain all that stuff, which is a big chunk, right? And then you have the end of it. Do you property manage it or do you put it on the market, right? Um, and that's the final part. So that's my thinking. But like when it comes to creating that process, whatever that thing is, it's like what is the where are you? The bottleneck is typically the one that I want to create the process for. Right. Yeah. Uh, and like, are you the only one that's doing this thing? And like, and you hate it. Like that's another thing. Like you hate it and somebody else could probably do it better than you. They probably got to get rid of it. Right. Um, and how do you process that out? What's also the simplest sometimes too. Like for me, like Dropbox file organization, like that's the simplest thing. Like just get that dialed in. Right. And everybody has to buy into it. And I'm a jerk about it in my businesses. Like if, uh, you have to hold that line because there's a big difference yeah. when it comes to to delegation versus abdication mm. and delegation is holding people accountable. You actually have to like, you could delegate it, but you still got to hold them accountable to get their job done. Abdication is like you give it to somebody and you never talk to them again <laughs> and you just ignore them, right? Yep. Um, which I'm very good at that. But, and then you come back and you're like, why isn't this done right? And like, well, because you abdicated them, right? Instead, you ignored them. So you still got to toe the line because what gets measured gets done. Yep. And that's, that's so important. You have to hold that line until somebody else could hold the line for you. Uh, and that sometimes never happens until you find the right person. But I'm talking about Dropbox folders even is, you know, I have, I'm, dude, I'm a dick, dude. Uh, I have guys on my team or one of my favorite people in my life actually is this guy, Nate, uh, who he was with me in Instagram forever. Uh, he ran our acquisitions. I would literally not buy a deal just because the Dropbox folders weren't right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's how much I'm an idiot I am, but also how much I'm like, volume is no problem for me for deals. And I'm like, guess what? It so sucks that you were not buying this deal because you didn't put the folders in the right spot. Oh uh, my gosh, I love it. Guess who got the folders in the right spot for now? <laughs> so like, yeah. that might've been the dumbest thing in the world that people were like, that's dumb. I don't know, man. Like I'm a big- You got the point across. Got a point across. I made this guy, I feel, I can talk just, I should, uh, poor Nate went through so much with me. Um, where he, you always had to take pictures of the, uh, uh, this is my favorite story about him when he was like learning, uh, you have to, you always got to take pictures of the electrical panel. Like that's how we are. Like you gotta find it, especially where we were in Seattle, Tacoma, you have a hundred year old houses. Some of those panels are just like the screw in knobs and stuff. So you got to find it, right? Is it, is it a you know, federal Pacific? Is it a Zinsco? Is it like whatever, like all these square D like all these panel stuff. So he drove a house. And like, there's no pictures of the panel. Like, I'm like, hey, where's the panel? He's like, bro, there's no panel on this house. It just doesn't have one. And I'm like, there's a, have a every house has an electrical panel. Like, he's like, it's not there. I'm like, did you check the out? <laughs> like, did you check the outside? Oh, and he's boy, like, mate. they put electrical panels on the outside. I'm like, yeah, a lot of times actually. <laughs> like, and so he lives an hour from this property. He's already pretty. Oh. He's already home. And I'm like, you got to go back. Gotta go. And. Now, what he didn't know is I was already, I already said no to the property. Uh, I wasn't going to buy it. So, but the, but I made him, he didn't know that. So he had to go drive back to the property, go take the electric way and I'll come back. And then when he was driving back, like, yeah, I already said no to it. So the, uh, for <laughs> oh, but he's cussing you. He's, but no, those are lessons yeah. you got to learn, dude. It's like, if you don't learn those lessons, you don't get better. You don't grow. He, and he's like, dead. 
every property after that, you'd I go in Dropbox, there'd be 30 photos of the electrical panel from every angle imaginable. Like every single like he just did that. Like you'd, uh, just, you'd just see like he'd have every angle up, down, left, right, everything. There'd be 20 to 30 photos of the electrical panel from every angle for after, Oh anyways. my gosh. So that's that holding is- that line, maybe in a jerk way, right? A little bit, but like he takes perfect pictures today. So yeah, he's uh, on the deck. Yeah, you gotta have the right team you can do that with though. So that's the other side. Oh yeah, yeah, you gotta know your personalities who's gonna handle what. So we got about three minutes left. It looks like you did flipping for years, obviously crushed it, made a lot of money. You've learned a ton, you got great systems in place. Now you got your own fund, you've got your own lending arm. Um, You do a lot of different things, Mm -hmm. but I believe I saw where you have transitioned into potentially holding some of these properties in your portfolio through burring. When did that, when did that switch take place? And why'd you, why'd you change strategies? Uh, the short version, 2016, um, done a ton of houses by then. And then we had this one house in Lakewood, Washington that I'm like, this kind of looks like a house maybe we should keep. Are you you're supposed to keep these things? I heard people keep houses. And uh, this <laughs> yeah, then one like, of your buddies, your buddies, he he keeps houses, right? Some, yeah, some people keep them, whatever. Like, and uh, the, so anyways, this house just like kind of looked right. And so we, uh, I'd convince my wife, I'm like, we should probably keep this one. And the, the escrow, when we went to go do the refi, like I had to come to the closing to do the refi with seventy six hundred dollars, and uh, and I immediately wanted to cancel the transaction and sell the house, because to me, like I never come to closing with money, right? And I'm like, I'm losing seventy six hundred dollars on this house. That's how I saw it. Mm-hmm. So this is a refinance, right? So Burr, right? Mm-hmm. It's a hundred and it was a hundred and eighty thousand dollar loan, right? Bought a house for about a hundred grand, put like sixty five seventy thousand into it after accrued interest because we always did accrued interest. Um, and costs and fees and points or whatever. Like I had to come to close with like 7,600 bucks uh, to pay for like the back end funding and everything. I'm like, I'm losing money on this deal. This is bullshit. Like, <laughs> that's how I saw it. The thing cash flowed 670 bucks a month, like after putting $7,600 into it. So you get like a 90 plus retur- percent return on your money. Uh, and I'm looking at this thing, like I'm losing money on this deal. So my wife convinced me that I was an idiot. So we kept it. Uh, and then it was about like six months later. I'm like, yeah, that's a good idea. We should we should definitely keep more. Should of do more of those. <laughs> and so we bought like three rentals, and then uh, in 2017, and then the or 2016, and then I bought like another five or six in 2017, and then in, uh, and then I decided like to go full burr uh, for various reasons for most of 2018, 19, and then leading on, uh, we would flip the ones that I hated, or we'd flip the ones that were like uh, we messed up. <laughs> so that was always a thing. So a good you have to. I believe this. You can't have a good burr unless it's a good flip. Mm-hmm. So it needs to be a good flip first. So our entire buying strategy didn't change, right? If a property met our flip box, we bought it. And if it then met our burr box, we kept it. And if it didn't meet our burr box after we bought it and messed up the rehab or went over budget or did something wrong, right? Then we sold it because it was a good, still a good flip. flip. Dude, I so, just did that just yeah. now. Because I don't know if you've run into this on Burr, because Burr has been my strategy. I bought my first two deals in 2018, rentals, mm-hmm. and with my own capital. And then I did the classic, hey, I'm out of money now. Bought them in rehab with my own money. So I had to figure out, how do I scale? I started Burring. And we acquired 19 properties the next year into mm-hmm. our portfolio. And then kept Burring. And you know we own a number of properties today through that strategy. And it's absolutely been amazing and you know i'm almost in a position now it's like do i really need to burn anymore now i'm almost flipping more just to generate more income because yeah, i wife wants to do a bunch of stuff at the house you know yeah, yeah. And so, but one thing i ran into to your point recently on this most recent burr that i thought i was burning that i'm now flipping is most of my loans are through small local banks on the refi with yeah. commercial loans so i've never done like strict dscr lenders yeah. traditionally i've done it a few times but mostly i'm commercial loans through small local banks well commercial lo- small local banks can kind of do what they want. And so, yeah, they can play by the debt coverage ratio or they can be like, you know what? You're refining this. It's a break even, or it's making 50 to hundred bucks a month, but you're making bank. You got a ton of assets. We'll still do the, the total amount you want. Totally. Well, because of the climate right now, I go to refi this burr that I had just done. Same bank I've been using thinking, you know, I knew it was going to be like a break even, or maybe even losing a couple bucks a month. Uh, but we we're going to get all our capital back out. And she comes back and she's like, oh, it doesn't meet our debt coverage ratio 1.2. I was yeah. like, Kim, I've been doing loans with y'all for years. Y'all have never cared about debt coverage, you know, up until this point because of the income I have, the other assets I have producing, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, oh, sorry, the, you know, the leadership's cracked down now at the bank and it has to meet 1.2 and you're just like 0.95. And I was like, well, can we put 
a year's worth of payment in escrow. Like, will that make you feel better? And they're like, no, they're kind of holding the line on this. And so we came to this point where it was like, okay, we can still refi, but we now we're going to have to leave 30, bu- 30 grand in the deal. Mm-hmm. Or we say, okay, do we sink maybe another 10 to 15K into it, flip it, and still pull out a 52 gross after closing calls? And that's what we're doing. And to your point, because we bought right, undervalued, and it made a good flip, and we thought it made a good burr. It did. It did until it didn't. We're okay. Like we're still walking out with a fifty-two thousand gross profit after closing costs and um, and fees. So there's you a real life example. It just happened to me literally two weeks ago that we were able to pivot and we're not stuck because we bought good. Yeah, I'm. I'm a big believer, man. Like if you get really good at flipping, you're then better than most landlords on the acquisition and stuff because you know how to take uh, most traditional landlords that put twenty percent down and put a tenant in it don't when they see a messed up ugly house they don't see like a rental right no. and a house flipper sees it as a rental uh but a landlord doesn't sorry a, a house flipper sees it as a flip a construction project now if you add that to the burr side where you're able to like fix up a crappy house and then rent it like that gives you an upper edge on so many different people even even house flippers because you could buy it at a different margin if you wanted to like there's just it gives you a lot of flexibility if you can keep it it's just harder to keep deals these days for most people which is why they're going to the flips but um, you know, it's, it's still a great model, right? That's actually the only reason why we raised our fund was, uh, so I cannot deal with bank financing right now. We can keep more of these. If I was still flipping, I wouldn't use the fund because it's a, I'm giving away too much equity. Yeah. Um, and I think there's still like, I still burr. It's just, you have to understand you're playing the debt coverage game. And you, correct. so you, when you're getting them at a, on the acquisition, you gotta make sure that price is right. And then on the rehab, we got to make sure that we're staying in that right box to be able to pull out as much money as possible as you know it's like we're not going to do a clean burr every single time Mm -mm. like you're not going to be able to take money all your money back every single time but it's like to your point it's like bro if we're only leaving five grand in the deal seven grand in the deal compared to 20 percent, like what it's a no-brainer oh i think you're going to find my friend a lot of small banks this year leading into 2025 it's going to get harder you got one point two yeah you got 1.2 trillion dollars of commercial debt coming due this year and next year. And the and and a lot of that's on multifamily and commercial properties that aren't going to be able to get out of it. And so that's going to create a lot of ripples. You're going to see that affect a lot of local community banks. Uh, I promise you, you record this, stamp it, whatever, call my shit, like uh, you know, a year and a half, two years from now, whatever you want to do. <laughs> like, But like, um, that's coming. That's coming for sure. And how that's going to affect single family, I'm not really sure yet. Uh, but it's definitely going to affect the banking system. That's for sure. And it's definitely going to affect commercial and multi. It already is. Just nobody's talking about it. <laughs> so the, and these small local banks love commercial and they love multi or they did. They did. They did. Yeah. They don't which, right now. Which but. is why their credit, um, uh, what are they called? Like uh, the credit boards or whatever their um, debt. Anyways, they all meet. Like they meet like yeah. people and they say, do we want to do this loan or not? Which is why they're cracking down, which is why they're tightening up their, their balance sheet. And because they have to. And so, because they see what's coming down the pipeline. Uh, and so I think it's going to get harder. So it's not going to get fun, easy. Fun next year and a half, two years. Hopefully rates keep dropping. And um, yeah, you know, I don't think it will, dude. <laughs> so, so it's not dropping. Do what? It's not going to drop. I don't know. The The Fed say they're looking at three. We'll see. It'll nope. be fun to see what happens. The, you say no. I say I yes. No. No. We'll, we'll have to. That's wishful we'll, thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, as Jen Saki would say, we'll circle back at the end of this year and see yeah. who's right. Hey, Tarl, man, I really appreciate you coming on. This was awesome. Love chatting with you. Uh, Limitless Expo, when is that? Where can people sign up? Yeah, so Kim Ackerell and I do a joint event called Limitless Expo. Uh, it's August, end of August. Go to limitlessexpo.com. Uh, it's a financial freedom conference that has real estate, of course, in it because it's Kim Ackerell and I. Uh, and we always, it's in my opinion, non-biased opinion, it's the best conference out there, uh, and completely non-biased. And then you can also go to tarlyarber.com for all my, uh, antics and newsletter stuff that I do as well. And then Instagram. So sweet. What is your newsletter called again? I saw it in the show notes. I uh, just go to tarlyarber.com. <laughs> so, okay. Cool. I thought you had yeah. a fancy name for I, it. I'm pretty sure I do. Like, uh, like I write it, or I have to actually write it as soon as we get off this, but the, I write every word on it. Um, but we have another, like, we have a group called flippers anonymous. Uh, that might be part of what you're maybe talking about, but, gotcha. um, 
that's for house house flipping addicts and people that want to get out of house flipping. <laughs> but yes, flippers anonymous. Yes, yeah. that is okay. And the newsletter. Yeah, I'm yeah. tracking. I had them so. confused. Tarl, dude, appreciate it, man. You're a great hang. You have a lot of experience, guys and gals. If you got any questions, go bug Tarl to death. I know he would love it. Totally. He, uh, <laughs> he's been doing this for a long time. He's a vet. So yeah. Tarl, thanks for being old man. We'll talk again. Thanks, Jared.